Jenny, I'm home. I know, Father. Hello, everyone. This is Ray Green, once again greeting you on behalf of Oscar Serlin's production of America's most beloved comedy, Life with Father, now in its second year at the Empire Theater on Broadway. You've just heard Father greet Vinny with his usual homecoming, and that means that Howard Lindsay, star and co-author of Life with Father, is with us again with another famous American father as his guest. Before we tell you who Mr. Lindsay's guest is this time, a word of interest to all. Our famous father today is a man whose voice is known to every radio listener in the country and every person who has seen a 20th century Fox movie tone newsreel. For instance, this might be a quick resume of his varied life and the things he has done. He has been a gold miner, cow puncher, janitor, salesman, short order cook, reporter, editor, college professor, biographer, speaker, traveler, screen commentator. In Russia, he flew from the Black Steppes to Moscow over the historic territory Napoleon advanced on in his ill-fated campaign. In Germany, at the end of the World War, he broke through the Allied blockade and brought back an eyewitness account of the German Revolution all the way from Kiel to the mountains of Bavaria. In Afghanistan, he took the first pictures of the historic Khyber Pass, the most famous and the most strongly fortified mountain gorge on Earth. In England, he created a sensation as an American who came to reveal to the English for the first time the mystery of their countrymen, Lawrence of Arabia, and the revolt of the desert. In Spain... From London to Asia Minor and back from Paris to Poland, from the Balkans to Scandinavia, and from Moscow to Spain, he flew through every type of weather with only one serious mishap, a nosedive into a lonely Spanish valley. Put them all together and they spell father. Our famous father for this week, who for ten years has been the leading radio news commentator, whose broadcasts circle the earth, the author of 35 books and often called the foremost adventure biographer of our time, Lowell Thomas. <laughs> After that, ladies and gentlemen, I am shocked that I hear no trumpets. Ah, there they are. I was astounded that my entrance was on so simple a note. I have carefully looked around to see if you were talking about somebody else. There being no one else present... Well, I'll just have to step up and take bows for all these other fellows. We never allow undue modesty on the part of famous fathers on this program, Lowell. So you needn't start the practice. You know, Lowell, you're a storyteller. How do you mean that, Howard? In the best way possible. You tell them to everybody else every night. And now that we've got you here, we want you to tell us one. Well, you mean weave a yarn? No, we want a real one. Oh. One of the most picturesque stories that I've ever heard was the adventure of an airman with whom I flew out in Egypt during the last year of the World War. The flyer's name was Captain Guy Duncan Smith. Although I found him serving with the British Royal Naval Flying Corps, he was an American from Berkeley, California. In 1914, when the World War broke out, he was a gunrunner in Mexico. He jumped to Canada, enlisted in the famous Princess Pats. That got him across to the war in a hurry. Later, he became a flyer with the British guarding the Suez Canal. The famous German raider Wolf was playing havoc with shipping in the Indian Ocean. So Guy Duncan Smith and his plane went out over those waters on the deck of a British cruiser, the Raven. He was flying a two-seater. His observer, an Englishman named Meade. Every day they would take off from the deck for a flight over the Indian Ocean to see if they could spot that elusive raider Wolf. One day when they were on a reconnaissance jaunt, they were so interested in scanning the horizon that they lost sight of their mother ship, the cruiser. Round and round they circle. I say, Guy, where are we? You're a fine observer. What do you mean, where are we? Look back at the raven. You can tell right away. Well, I, I can't seem to find it. Well, it ought to be over here. We'll head in this direction. You better hurry up, old boy. It's, it's getting late. Say, Mead, what do you think we ought to do? Uh, maybe that's it over there. I don't think so. I tell you, old boy, I, I think we ought to set it down. Set her down on what? It's all in the ocean. It'd swallow us up faster than it did the raven. Well, we'll have to find some place. It's getting dark. Uh, say, say, how about that island? Look at it. My gas is low. I'm not sure we can make it. We better try. Looks like our only chance. All right, here goes. Are we all right? We're okay. Straight ahead. We're out of gas. I'll have to let it glide. Well, pick out that big one. These islands, look. What's the matter, guy? We're losing altitude. I can't help it. Hold on tight. I'll try to land her in the bay. Maybe somebody will pick us up. Hold on. Well, well here we are. That was narrow. I never thought we'd make it. Uh, did we? Well, it isn't such a bad-looking bay. Well, it hardly looks like the raven, old chap. Well, I'd say the water is a little soft. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, looks like rain, what? Yeah, we ought to get out of here. Well, where will we go? Well, suppose we get out and look around. Where do you think we are? Well, a bit hard to tell. Looks like nothing but a coral reef to me. That sure is deserted. Uh, those are coconut trees over there. Yeah, so they are. So maybe we'd better shoot them down. I'm ready to substitute coconuts for breakfast if I have to. You know, they're better for breakfast anyway. Only, uh, I can't swim to get them. Oh, say, I forgot about that. Uh, you take this little balloon tied around your neck. Yeah. Uh, take off your clothes. I'll give you one of my fins. Oh. You've got to get over to the Aster and get some breakfast, even if it's only coconuts. <laughs> No use, Guy. I, I, I don't think I can make it. Now just rest on me. We've got a couple of more yards to go. We'll be all right. Oh, I'm, I'm all in. Just hold on and we'll... Hey, you feel it? Feel it. It's the ground. We've landed. Uh, are you sure? Ah, here we are. Say, what's the idea of wearing shoes? No wonder I couldn't hold you up. this hut over here. There's no one here at all. Do you see anyone? No, but I found some breakfast. Bravo! Where is it? Right here. Hi, it's kippers after all. <laughs> Looks more like dried fish. Well, to you me. know, it's better than coconuts. Here, taste it. Yeah, that's not bad. And here's some rice. I wonder where the boys who live here went. Well, I'm going to lie down and get some sleep. Uh, call me at seven, Chief. <laughs> The two flyers had no idea where they had come down. Had they known, their knowledge wouldn't have lessened their anxiety. For this was one of the Maldive Islands, a group which lies between the coast of Africa and India, between Zanzibar and Ceylon. There are no shipping lanes anywhere near. And the primitive Negroid inhabitants who lived in these huts, they had never seen a white man before. And when they saw that huge bird swoop down out of the sky and two strange creatures... Apparently, two white gods jump out and swim ashore. Well, the savages beat it for the coconut palms. In the middle of the night... Me. Me, me. Come on, wake up. Listen to that. What is it, old chap? Uh, What time is it? What is it? Look out there. Look at all those savages. Savages? Here, in England's country? Oh, dear. Well, what do we do? They've surrounded the hut. What are we going to do? Well, you have me there, old boy. I have the slightest idea what to do. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's go out there. I'll say salam. Salam? Yeah, everybody understands that. We might as well take a chance. Come on out. Well, I'll try it now. Salam! Salam! I say, where are they going? They're going to the boats. They don't seem to want to eat us after all. You frightened them away, old chap. Ah, well, what are we going to do now? Mead, will you stop running up and down with that white rag in your hair? Nobody's going to see us. We just got to wait for those natives to come back. We won't stay away forever. They live here. But we've been here for seven days, and they haven't come back. I tell you, I can't stand it. I, I want to go home. Get me out of this place. I can't stand it. Me, they've got to come back. Well, well why don't they, then? We're going to die here. I want to go back to England. I... Me, take it easy. Keep uh... cool. Look, Me. Look, they're coming back. They're coming back in their boats. I'll swim out. Well, all right, all right, but don't say salam again. At any rate, Guy Smith was careful not to say salam again. He climbed in the native boat and persuaded them to come back and get Mead. And then they took the boys to another island where they lived for nearly a month. Mead was getting more and more upset. How can you be so cheerful, Guy? We've been in this forsaken place for a month now. We'll never get back. Why don't you stop that confounded singing? Oh, I I get a kick out of these guys. Listen, you want to hear something good? Listen to them sing. All right, boys, let's get together now. Now watch the big stick. All right. One, two, three. Way down, Swanee River. Swanee. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, 
Oh, that's great. Right. That's fine. Swanee! That's fine. That's fine. I think they're a bit tired of that Swanee River song. I know I am. All right, then. Show them your false teeth. Go ahead. Take them out and show them. From then on, Guy Duncan Smith's star waned. The islanders came from far and near to see the amazing white man who could remove his teeth, take out his mouth. Soon the natives took Smith and Meade to a still larger island. There they were turned over to the sultan and given a warm welcome. But much to their distress, they were kept prisoners in the royal palace. The sultan knew a thing or two about the outside world. The sultan, in fact, had a house of lords, all of whom wore red skirts reaching to their knees, a scarlet jacket, and a tall red stovepipe hat about twice the height of a Turkish fez. To honor the boys, he dressed them up the same way. No one on the island could speak a word of English, so the boys never knew what their fate was going to be, until the sultan and his staff one day came along, put them in a boat loaded with coconuts, and sailed them across to the island of Ceylon, to the city of Colombo. And there they actually found their cruiser Raven lying at anchor in the harbor. The shipwrecked flyers were still dressed in their curious costumes. Their faces half hidden by straggly beards. Why did the sultan send them back? Well, many years ago, the British government made a treaty with the sultan, providing for British protection against aggression and annexation by any other foreign power. And in return, the Maldives were to protect shipwrecked mariners cast up on their shores. And this was the first time any sultan had ever had the opportunity to carry out his part of the contract. You know, Lowell, that story sounds like one of those thrillers the kids listen to every afternoon on the radio. (laughs) That's the way with truth. It steals up on you and makes you disbelieve it. Thank you, Lord Thomas and Howard Lindsay. And so we come to a close in another in this new series of programs, which brings you America's famous fathers. Howard Lindsay will return again next week with another famous American father as his guest. And remember, these programs are brought to you each week at the same time through the cooperation of Life with Father, currently playing in New York City, in Chicago, and in Boston. In appreciation for the appearance of Mr. Lowell Thomas on our famous father's program, we wish to thank the Sun Oil Company, from whom... Lowell Thomas appears as the Sunoco News Voice of the Air and 20th Century Fox Movie Tone News. And now on behalf of Lowell Thomas and Howard Lindsay and the entire company of Life with Father, this is Ray Green hoping that you'll make your life with father and mother a very happy one. <laughs>